He liberated color from line. You don't need form to express the power of nature. You don't need line or contour to communicate revulsion. Fine arts illuminate our present and explicate our past. SCAD professors teach brilliant young creators every day. And in this series, we reveal the works that most inspire our experts. This is SCAD Class. Today we'll study the stirring masterpiece, Slave Ship, by Great Britain's most admired artist, J.M.W. Turner. Joining me for today's conversation is SCAD Professor of Art History, Lindsay Alberts. When you first look at it, you're not quite sure what you're looking at, but you know it's beautiful. You, know, you see this incredible red sunset, this almost peel of white paint. You see all this color. And as you look at it longer, you start to realize that you're actually looking at something horrible. We see the ship, we see the typhoon, you can see the sort of white uh, sea foam and sea spray indicating mm -hmm. the ship is struggling. It looks like the whole ship is gonna be lost anyway. Exactly, and I think Turner maybe is saying, you know. The wages of sin. Precisely, mm -hmm. precisely. We might be sort of caught by the beauty of nature, the power of nature. And then we start to realize that, oh, something really awful is happening here. It's not about the ship, it's not about the storm. If we look, especially in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see there are people in the water. There are manacled people in the water, even worse. Uh, and in the bottom right corner, there's this incredibly um, elegant, almost horrifically elegant leg poking out of the water mm -hmm. as uh, sort of sea monsters and fish are descending upon it. And the title tells us everything we need to know. It's called The Slave Ship, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon Coming On. Mm -hmm. We realize then that we're actually seeing, as the title says, slavers throwing people overboard Turner was uh, partially inspired by an actual event, unfortunately, that took place uh, in 1781. Uh, a slave ship called the Zong uh, was traveling from Africa to Jamaica. A lot of things went wrong, shall we say, and the captain of the ship chose to murder many of the enslaved who were unfortunately considered cargo uh, by throwing them overboard. He knew that the insurance policy would only reimburse him if the enslaved were, quote, lost at sea, not if they died. So unfortunately, uh, he made the horrific choice to, to throw them overboard. Turner's a passionate abolitionist. One of the things that I love about Turner, and I think this is true when you study almost any great artist, is that they were humans. Yeah. And Turner did not begin as an abolitionist. He actually invested in 1805 in a ranch in Jamaica that used forced labor. Really? We know by the early 30s, he was supporting political candidates who were very strong abolitionists. So he does seem to have had a change of heart. Once he became an abolitionist, he was very, very uh, ardent in his support of the movement. And actually, 1840 is the year that this work was made. And 1840, not coincidentally, uh, was also the year that the World Anti-Slavery Convention was held in London. In Britain at the time, the slave trade had been abolished, but unfortunately, slavery itself was still legal. So he was pushing for the abolition of of slavery as a complete institution. This painting was his contribution to the anti-slavery movement. 
let's think about him as a person mm. and a little bit about his life. Mm. He was born in Covent Garden and his father was a barber. His uh, roots, as you mentioned, were very working class. His father supported Turner from a very early age as yes. an artist. Yes. He would sort of post his early sketches uh, in his shop and Turner sold his first work at the age of 11. He started out studying with architects and learned the technical aspects of drawing and painting. Had his first work accepted at the Royal Academy at 15. His first painting that was exhibited at the Royal Academy was a watercolor, and you're absolutely right, it's very structured. Mm -hmm. It's all about perspective. It's very precise. Precise is a great word, and when you look at it, oh, that's not what I expected of Turner. Where's <laughs> the atmosphere? At the Royal Academy, he was actually professor of perspective. And when whenever I think about that, I think about how perspective and linear perspective, it's such a structured approach yes. to the world. And yes. I think, as you mentioned, that came from his training early on as an architectural um, draftsman. But then he seems to have evolved into almost a mistiness. That's a wonderful word for it because he was known, especially by the time this painting was made, he was really famous for painting light on water and water. mistiness is such a part of that. But I think your point is a great one that the reason Turner could make these very innovative departures yeah. from even something as important as line or yes. wedding color to line, the reason he was able to do that is because he had that grounding in mm -hmm. the mechanics and the foundations. I think Turner truly is the first modern painter because he's the first to liberate color from line. You oh, can see that here. I see that. You, know, you don't need form to express mm -hmm. the power of nature. You don't need line or contour to communicate revulsion. Mm -hmm. Color itself can do that. His use of color is so commanding. I heard it said sometimes that he painted with mustard. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I love that you said that in this painting because whenever I hear that, I think of this particular work. Another work that has that sort of mustard quality is The Fighting Temeraire, mm. another magnificent sunset. And you're absolutely right, he, Turner was really... He was kind of rough, wasn't he? Oh, he absolutely. got in there. He, I love that <laughs> phrase, he got in there. The thing that you first notice is the damage to the painting. And I don't mean damage as mm. in damage over time, but Turner's damage to it. He's mm. scratching, he's jabbing, he's using the paint knife, he's spitting on the canvas in some cases. And he used his fingernails. And... Oh yeah, absolutely. And this painting is a great example. Just near the mass of the ship, sort yes. of to the back, there's some scratches. Yes. And in the actual canvas, you can see they're scored into the oh. thick paint. And you can really get a sense of the the energy, the, almost the frenzy that he painted in, and mm -hmm. sort of the lack of regard for tradition. You know, yeah. he's not lightly dabbing paint. No, no, he's he really, literally attacked a subject. He, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Turner painted this painting very much as a anti-slavery call to arms. And what I love about this painting in particular is it's a rough painting of a rough subject. You know, the the medium is the message. As we say in art history sometimes, that's so true here. Turner's a beloved painter today, but what about when this was first exhibited? You know, there's a great trope of the misunderstood artist in their own time, and Turner was not that, but he was very divisive. So he had champions who adored his work, people like John Ruskin, for example, who well, at the age of- That's not a bad one. Yeah, at the age of 16 was writing defenses of, uh, of Turner. And then he also had, as you mentioned, critics who attacked his work. The more profound his works were in terms of their topics, the more they were attacked. And mm -hmm. I think to some extent, critics were uncomfortable. You know, this is this is a brutal painting. It's awful to think about the event that precipitated it. It was, was and is hard to look at this painting, hard to really contemplate the experience depicted. The reviews of this painting were mixed when it was exhibited at the Royal Academy, as most of his works were. Um, well, he had a know. champion in John Ruskin, and you know, one of Ruskin's quotes is kind of one of our unofficial mottos <laughs> at SCAD, uh, fine art is that in which the head, hand, and heart of man go together. Of course. I think that's what we teach and what we do at SCAD, and so he must have been a pioneer.
powerful advocate. And I think this painting covers all of those, head, hand, heart. I mean, we talked about the heart. Certainly, it's it's a difficult work to look at. Yes. Your heart, you would have Your to heart. be made of stone yes. to, to yeah. not be moved. Mm -hmm. The hand is visible everywhere. Turner's hand, you know, scratching and jabbing at the painting. He was exceptionally intellectual. He was incredibly well-versed in ancient philosophy and classical antiquity. Hmm. He traveled in circles that included the most important natural philosophers of his time, including women. So that intellect is always a part of his works for sure. When you look at this painting, you don't immediately think of classical illusion. But his interest in weather, in optical phenomena, you know, what does the eye see when the sun sets on the water? You know, how does the water take on the colors of the sun? Mm -hmm. Those are all ideas that were very much at the forefront of scientific innovation at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so this painting is the perfect uh, combination of the head, the hand, and the heart. It's got all of those pieces there. And I think maybe that's why it's a masterwork in some ways, is that it engages us intellectually, it engages us emotionally, and it engages us in a sort of social quality, a social justice quality, yes. which is a very modern term, I realize, you know, very contemporary, but uh, that concept was certainly present in the 19th century. Ruskin himself. He used the power that he had. Absolutely, and the abolitionist movement was part of social justice. Ruskin, later in his life, really advocated for bringing design to as many people as possible. Yes. We would call that social justice today, so I think those connections are, are really powerful there. Very much. For Turner as a Brit, you mentioned what a beloved British artist he is. Fortunately, he lived to see slavery abolished in his home country. And then from there on out, the focus really was on the US. Turner is an artist who I think we sometimes overlook. He is not necessarily the most well-known name of the 19th century. People like Manet and Monet and the Impressionists often get you know, a little bit more flash than he does. Mm. But there would have been no Manet without Turner, absolutely, and there would have been no Impressionism without Manet. When we think about Turner as one of the early drivers of modernity, that goes directly into Impressionism and post-Impressionism and shapes our world even today. You know, SCAD students are creating works informed by that century. His legacy and his influence and the unfortunate history that he's recounting here, it continues to affect everyone, especially here at SCAD. So yes. it's been lovely to talk to you about it. Thank you. Thank you. For all of you watching, keep the conversation going in the comments, and I'll see you next time.